me, will you please, as we read from Luke 10, and beginning in verse 38. Luke 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful this morning for your word, thankful for the many blessings that you've sent our way over the past year as, a, as individuals and as a congregation. Lord, we stand in awe of what you have done and are doing. And Lord, we, we look forward, frankly, with great anticipation to what you will continue to do as we are faithful to you. And Lord, this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, such a key one, so, so pivotal to how we live our lives and to how we hear you, I just pray that you will bring it home to us in a special way. It takes your Holy Spirit, Lord, to move our hearts. We prepare as carefully as we can, try and learn your words, study, try and Make it so that we can understand. But Father, we, we recognize, I know, our congregation knows the Holy Spirit is the one who must open our hearts and make it real to us. And I pray that will be true from the youngest child who is here this morning to the oldest person who is here. Help us to hear you and help us to obey, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we continue our worship this morning by looking at God's Word. Some of you may feel like you're deja vu. I think I've heard this before. And if you were here seven years ago almost in May, you will have heard this before. This is repeated the sermon that I did at that point in time. If you were here and it doesn't sound familiar, I, your problem. I don't know what the deal is, but... Um, I thought as we came to this point in Luke, it's a wonderful time to renew and to, be, to review the truths that are here uh, for all of us, those of us who have heard them before, as well as those who have not been through this passage of Scripture. And so, it's a wonderful passage. I was watching a Monday night football game. Uh, one time, there's a news flash, but yeah, I do occasionally. And uh, on this game, Joe Theismann, this many years ago, was playing quarterback for the Washington Redskins, and he was tackled by Hall of Fame linebacker Lawrence Taylor for the New York Giants. Immediately, I mean immediately, Taylor was on his feet signaling for the sideline for help to come in because Theismann was in trouble. And boy, was he. I mean, when they showed the replay, any of you who saw that game, you'll know that his, you know, his right leg was going one direction until, until uh, Taylor hit him, and then it was going another direction. He, he, he totally fractured his leg, and it fractured his career as well. That was the last game he ever played. You don't need to feel sorry for him. He went on to become an announcer, I'm sure made more money afterwards than he ever did before. But he did fracture his leg in the meantime. And I think... You know, the point of that is a lot of Christians are living fractured lives as well. It's not fractured legs, but if you could just, you know, if you could spin the top right off of, of our head and look inside, you would find a tangled mess of fragmented thoughts going every which direction. As we are trying to do the right thing in a world that's very demanding and that is very chaotic. We have a boss that expects, you know, kind of like 50 hours a week minimum. And then we get home and we find, wow, we're doing our son's ball game and our daughter's dance recital at a Bible study and at a PTA meeting all at the same time. And pretty soon we're just frazzled, fragmented, fractured by all the requirements that are made on our lives. Here's something to remember. 
too many good things, too many good things can spell disaster. And that's just how Martha felt this morning as we come to this passage. But the interesting thing to me is, rather than sympathize with her, oh, gee, Martha, that's too bad. The Lord takes issue with how she had established her priorities. The issue isn't that we are so busy. The issue is that we have not correctly prioritized our lives and the things that God is asking us to do. Let me illustrate how important priorities are with this little story. This is my favorite baseball story, so always an excuse to tell it is good. It's a game that occurred in 1902. No, I was not there. But in 1902, there was a game between the, the Cubs and the Pirates. And the Cubs had a pitcher on the mound that day named Jimmy St. Vrain. Now, you could look it up. Jimmy St. Vrain, was, he was a pretty good left-handed pitcher, but he was a really, really lousy hitter. And that day in 1902, the first, time, first two times he came up, he struck out as usual, not even touching the ball. Well, about that time, the third, third base coach had an you know, epiphany, and he called St. Vrain over as he's going up to bat the third time, and he said, hey, Jimmy, he said, why don't you, instead, instead of batting right-handed, as was his norm, he said, why don't you try batting left-handed this time? After all, you got nothing to lose. The logic was irrefutable, right? He certainly had nothing to lose, and so he went up to bat left-handed. Well, as fate would have it, on the very first pitch, he hits the ball. And not only does he hit it, but it's a, it's a fair ball. That's, it's not much of a hit. It's a slow roller to shortstop, but it's a fair ball. St. Vrain is so excited. I mean, he's going to beat this out. It's the last thing he did. Legs churning, arms pumping. I mean, he's headed as fast as he can to beat the throw. There's only one problem. He was headed toward third base instead of toward first. Got all confused by turning around and batting from the wrong side of the plate. And his confusion, by the way, translated every, everybody else. Honus Wagner, who was great Pittsburgh shortstop at the time, said when he picked up the ball, he couldn't, he couldn't think at first, should I throw it at third or should I throw it at first? <laughs> Our confusion can be contagious. The point is, activity has to be prioritized. And for a Christian, beloved, all of our effort, all of our activity, all the things that we're involved in has to spring from a vital living relationship with Almighty God. If that doesn't happen, all kinds of bad things are going to occur. The one thing that's necessary, according to our Lord and Savior, is to be with Him. When you think about it for a moment, that kind of simplifies things a little bit, right? That's the first priority. We don't live frantic, frustrated, frantic lives because there are too many demands. We live frantic, frustrated lives because we haven't been with our Lord and Savior to find out what He wants, to find out where we should be going and spending time with Him. We've skipped first base. Is third base important if you're playing baseball? Absolutely. You can't score if you don't get to third base. But third base doesn't mean anything until you have been to first base, right? First things first. And that's what the Lord is trying to teach us here. Service for God doesn't count until we have been with God. We turn that around almost all the time. Martha paid dearly because she didn't get her priorities right. And beloved, we'll do the same thing. So let's look at what it cost her to get her priorities all messed up. Number one, she had problems with other people. She had problems with others. Battered relationships. If you got relationship problems this morning, you're not alone. So did Martha. Martha. Her busyness led to beaten relationships. They just weren't working. Look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted, literally drawn off in different directions, torn apart. Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha is 
ticked. Can you hear it in her voice? She's out there in the kitchen trying to make a great dinner for the, for the Lord, and Mary is, and Jesus as well are just sitting in there having a good old time conversing with each other, and she's coming and asking the Lord, fix this. Now, the first question we have to ask is, was Mary doing something she shouldn't have been doing? Was she being lazy, and was she leaving Martha to herself? Jesus doesn't seem to think so. In fact, in verse 40, we're told that Mary had left Martha, meaning that she had been with her earlier, helping get the things in order, helping get them prepared. But when the time came and sufficiently had, they were sufficiently in order, she checked out and went to be with Jesus. You see that also in verse 39. Uh, if you've got the ESV, you won't see it, but let me show you the translation. It says in she, verse 39, she, had, she, Martha, had a sister called Mary who, and then the word also is there in the original. It's not in the ESV. I have no idea why they didn't translate it, but it's there in the original. She, who, Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Mary helped, but then she also went to sit at the feet of Jesus. She wanted to be with Jesus even more than she wanted to serve him. Martha is all about activity. She loves Jesus too but she wants to show it by her activity and by her service, and her service distracted her so much that it killed her relationship with her sister Mary. Killed her relationship with Jesus, too. It's ironic, isn't it? Here she is in the very, she, she's failing at the very thing she most wants to do, right? She wants to serve Jesus. She wants to show her love for him, and in the process, she fails to do that, she gets mad at him, and then she blames him. Send Mary out to help me. Lord, do you, do you not care? Do you not care? Imagine accusing Jesus of not caring. But that's where trying to serve him without being with him will lead us. It'll lead us to wrong conclusions about the people that, are, that we're serving with and about the Lord that we're serving for. This is what always happens when we're serving out, as, out of a sense of duty, you see, instead of a sense of love, because we love the Father, because we love the Lord Jesus, and we want to serve, and when we're serving out of a sense of duty, resentment's always gonna, gonna come. Listen, here's the principle, very simple principle here. We will never get along with others until we get alone with Him. We won't get along with others until we've been alone with him. We will kill relationships and we'll come to resent the Lord himself. You know, during World War II, the Japanese had a huge edge at the start, right? President Roosevelt had not been able to rally the isolationist sentiment throughout the United States to even begin to prepare for the possibility of war. And so when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor and destroyed most of the fleet, thankfully the, air, the, 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 uh, the uh, carriers were out, but the, all the battleships were there, and many of them were destroyed or put out of commission in that great first strike that they made. And it was only six months later, six months later that a pivotal battle happened at Midway in the Pacific. Now, fortunately, the United States by that time had broken the Japanese code, and at least they knew what was coming. But they were still hugely outnumbered as they went into that battle. And there over the, over the horizon, they knew there was the great Japanese fleet. But this is where the providence of the Lord, you know, comes into play. It allowed, the, it allowed what happened to Pearl Harbor, undoubtedly, to, to get sentiment going in the right direction. But now, at the beginning of that great battle of Midway, what happened was some of the American flyers were able to destroy right early in the battle, almost right off the bat, destroy the bridge of the commanding, of the ship of the commanding admiral for the Japanese. And immediately from that moment on, every captain of a ship in that Japanese fleet was on his own. Didn't have any head to tell him what to do and where to go and where to be. And it wasn't very long before in the confusion as darkness began to settle in, not only were the Japanese losing, they were shooting at each other. 
The defeat became a rout, all because communication with the head was lost. And beloved, the, the point is, we'll be shooting at each other too. Where does sniping and bitterness and intolerance and feeling like I'm the one that has all the answers and nobody else, where does all that come from? It's because we haven't been with the head because we haven't been with Jesus and, and understood that, guess what? He's in control. Even if I'm right and everybody else is wrong, he's in control. I don't have to fix everything. And understanding that others do have a part to play. And understanding that theirs may be different from mine and all the other things that I need to understand, but it all comes from not being with him. And we even begin to resent God. I have to be with him. If your relationships are battered at home, you know, the best thing you can do is get with the Lord. Be with Him. Second thing Martha encountered here were problems with self. She had problems with others and then she had problems with self. She was frustrated. She was anxious. Look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted, again, pulled apart, fractured. With much serving, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. I mean, Martha's having a nervous breakdown trying to serve the Lord, right? She's, she's, the word drawn away there is really interesting because what's she trying to do? She's trying to be close to the Lord, right? She's trying to have a relationship. She wants to show him her love, but in the process of trying to do that, she's actually being pulled away. Her effort is causing her to be moving further away from him instead of closer to him. She's fractured by her service. The word anxious there speaks of inner turmoil. It's speaking of the, she, she's just a bundle of nerves inside. You know, she's not even saying everything she really wants to say. She's thinking it, you been there? But she's not saying all of it. But inside it's, oh, she's a turmoil going on. It's the same word that's used in Philippians 4, 6 where the Lord says, be anxious for nothing. Martha is the exact opposite of that in this passage of Scripture. And then the word troubled speaks of outward discontent, speaks of her busyness. You know, move another couch in. We, we, we got to get this set up for whoever the number of people are. Uh, season the meat again. Uh, get the table setting just right. A couple years ago when Patty and I were in England, uh, the queen was away and so we had the privilege to go to Buckingham Palace. They won't allow us in the palace when the queen is there, but when the queen is gone, we were allowed to go in. And so we had a great time going through Buckingham Palace and seeing how the other half lives. And uh, one of the places we were allowed to go was the state dining room. And it was a fascinating thing to see how it's all done there. But the, but the thing that most, that took my fancy the most was to see how the, uh, how the, uh, how the servants are, are trained to put the place settings precisely where they belong. I mean, you, gotta, you have to measure. They have measuring things to measure exactly how far the plate is from this edge, how far it is from the other plate, how far the fork is from the... It's amazing. Of course, it looks beautiful when it gets set up, but man, it's a... It, this is Martha. It has to be perfect because this is the Lord after all. But do you see that her desire to serve has overcome her desire for a relationship. It's the relationship that matters. She's missed that. She's substituting service for relationship. God made us, beloved, to be with him before we ever get out doing something. We'll be the same nervous wreck that Martha was if we don't learn that. There's a great illustration um, from a book ball, call, called, uh, called Somewhat Less Than God. It's a doctrine of man by a man named Leonard Verdun. In this, he tells a story of a kind of, of African ant. And uh, like most ants that you will have seen, this, the, the, these are huge ants, but the young are sheltered and the queen is sheltered under a great maze of underground tunnels, Right? But the workers, the workers go out and forage for food in faraway places. But this particular kind of ant, there's an interesting thing that happens. If the queen is molested or any, in any way disturbed while the workers are out foraging, 
they become disoriented and they, and they begin to move around nervously and they, and, and they get distracted and uncoordinated. If the queen is killed, they get absolutely, even though they're far away, they get absolutely panic-stricken, running in all kinds of circles, doing just bizarre things in random order until they die. You know, they, they, they haven't discovered yet, but they believe there must be some radar kind of device that keeps them oriented to the queen when she's okay. But if she's gone, they are lost. And that Beloved, is exactly who we are without being connected to our head, Jesus Christ. The reason we're distracted, the reason we're worried, is we've forgotten he's in charge. When you're with him, and you realize this is the king of the universe, he can do anything he wants, and if he's not doing it, there must be a reason, and if I ask him to do it, he probably will, but if he doesn't, there's a reason. I mean, we begin to get perspective, but when we lose the perspective and we're not in touch with him, we become disoriented, we become fruitless, we become frustrated, we become panic-stricken. Before he wants our service, God wants us to be Fixated on him. Fixated on him. He's our rock. He's our stability. He's the place where we find comfort and or ch challenge whatever it is we need. Disorientation, frustration, anxiety, they all show we're not locked into our head. Not locked on. Let's take Mary's part. Get at his feet. Be oriented. Listen. Let me put it this way. It's more important for you and for me to be with the Lord and to be spending time with Him than it is with our spouse. It's more important for us to be with our Lord than it is to be spending time with our children if we're parents. Does that put it in perspective? If you're going out of your way to find ways to spend time with spouse, family, parents, kids, and so on, but you're not spending time with the Lord, you got your priorities screwed up. That's how important it is to be with Him. Third thing, third problem that Martha had. She had problems with God. She had problems with God. That's a pretty comprehensive set of problems she had. When you say with others, with self, and now with God, what was the problem with God? She had an inability to separate need from necessity, and it led to a whole bunch of just wasted effort. Wasted. All right, Martha is living a wasted life at this point, even though she's doing it all for Jesus. You can do it all for Jesus and be living a wasted life. Verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. What Jesus is saying, you've got to get to first base before you can go home, and Mary has chosen the right thing. Mary has chosen the thing that will last. Mary's chosen the thing of eternal value. By implication, Martha has not. Martha is cooking a meal which will be gone as soon as it's eaten, right? And here's the problem. You could cook a meal and have it be of eternal value, but she's not doing that. She's cooking it all in her own flesh. She's doing it all in her own strength. It's wood, hay, and stubble that will be judged at the judgment as unworthy. Because it didn't come from a relationship with Christ. It came from a good intention that didn't have the right priority. Now listen carefully, because what I want to say now is the heart of this passage. Here's the heart of it. Mary thought that the way to significance was to meet every need. Mary thought that the way to significance was to meet every need. Don't we often feel that way? How could you blame her for that? Here she is trying to go to second and third and home all at the same time because she sees need there. She sees need and she wants to meet them. How can you fault someone who just wants to meet needs? 
but Jesus faults her. Jesus faults her. Mary's premise is this, beloved. Mary's premise is everything is necessary. And Jesus stopped her cold with his statement, no, no, Martha, only one thing is necessary. Your premise is wrong. Now, there are great implications from that. Only one thing is necessary, and it wasn't any of the things that Martha was up to. There's never a lack of need, is there? We need third grade teachers. I don't think we do right now, but you know, we, occasionally we do. We need, uh, we, 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 need, we need somebody to be in the praise team. I, don't, I, don't, I think we're always looking for praise team people, right? But, um, but we've we got a lot of people there right now. But there's always need, right? We need, to, we need to do something for the poor. We need a VBS volunteer. We need somebody to head up the mission team the next time there's a mission trip. It's never a question of need. There's always need, beloved. Never a question of need. It's a question of what is necessary. What is necessary? Until we sort out the difference between need and necessity, we're going to live frustrated, frenzied, fractured existences. What is necessary is to be with Jesus. What is necessary is to have a relationship with the Lord where you are hearing him through his word and where you are speaking to him in prayer. That is what is necessary. Nothing else is necessary. Other things are needs. They're not necessities. Jesus never intended that we do it all. And when we are with him, when we're spending time with him, when we have a devotional time with him, he will help us sort out what is your need. What is the need that I want you to fill? Given that you're not, you can't fill them all. What do I want you to be doing? He'll tell us what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But he can't do that if we're not giving him time to speak to us. We're not giving him opportunity to hear him. Martha confused need with necessity and became useless. On the other hand, Jesus said concerning Mary, verse 42, but one thing is necessary and Mary has chosen the good portion. She's chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. Martha's service, wonderfully intended but anxiously executed, doesn't count. It doesn't count. But Mary's worship will never be taken away from her. Why? It says because she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. I mean, think about that for a moment. Wouldn't you think that Martha's well-intentioned efforts to produce a good meal, wouldn't you think that that would count? She's trying. It should have some worth, right? You would think so. But just the opposite is true. Jesus says there's one thing necessary. Worth is ascribed to doing nothing more than being with Jesus and worshiping at his feet. That's the most countable thing any of us can ever do. That's the most worthwhile thing any of us can ever do. Mary is sitting there, not a single earthly need is being met. And Jesus says that's the thing that was necessary that would produce... that would produce eternal value. That's amazing to me. But you see, what Jesus knew is that that's first base. He's not saying Mary should never do anything. But he's saying it all starts here. You have to get to first base before you can go on. It turns out the biggest need is our need of God. (laughs) How we forget that. We, we, we get the impression that God needs us. No, no, it's the other way around. We need him. That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. The paradox of Martha is that in trying so hard to meet every need, she was meeting no need at all. She was effort without direction. She was ambition 
without devotion, and it will not work. Meantime, Mary found in devotion the one thing that was necessary to produce eternal results. I mean, what a paradox. There's a reason this story is in the Bible, right? The simple little story. That's what it's trying to teach us. We've all heard, I'm sure, the fellow who loved his wife so much, you know, that he swam the widest ocean for her. He climbed the highest mountain. He crossed the most, the worst desert in the world. But there was nothing he wouldn't do for her. But she divorced him anyway. He was never home. <laughs> That's the way a lot of us are. Jesus was never home. When was the last time you just sat for five minutes and did nothing and listened to the Lord as you re read his word? When was the last time? We're not home, beloved. That can only lead to a life that's fragmented and frustrated with others, with God, with self. So busy doing for him that we don't have time to be with him. Now, let me pose this question. Why is it that we don't spend more time with the Lord? I'm guessing some of you would say, well, you know, I'm just not the meditative type, you know. I'm a person of action. My wife may be, but I, you know, I, I'm a person of action. I'm type A. I have to suggest to you, I don't think there was any more type A person in the world than Martha. And God didn't accept that excuse from her. I don't think he's going to accept it from us either. We're not talking about being a meditative type person. We're not talking about being a monk. We're just talking about being with a real Jesus Christ and being serious about it. Some of you will say, I'm too busy. I'm just, you know, I, 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 I'm just, I try, but I'm too busy. You know, life intrudes and I'm just too busy and... To that, I ask the question, okay, how many hours a week do you watch sports on television? How many hours shopping? How many hours hunting or fishing or whatever? We do whatever we want to do, right? We do. We find time for the things we want. We find times for the things we value. And the question here is, do we value Jesus enough to spend time with him? Listen, I grant you that in the 21st century world, time is at a premium. It is. But there's time for this if we want it. Time is not the problem. It's the excuse. Laziness and indifference is the problem. Let's call it what it is. Time is the excuse. I mean, worst case, you get up 15 minutes earlier in the morning, right? Right? or stay up 15 minutes longer at night. Better in the morning, you're fresher then. Warren Wiersbe says this, he says, if men like Moses, David, and Paul had to get alone with God in order to get their work done, how much more do we need that quiet time at the beginning of each day? D.L. Moody said it this way, he said, I love this one, if you have so much business to attend to that you have no time to pray, Dependent on it, depend upon it, you have more business on hand than God ever intended you should have. It's a question of priorities. And it may mean something has to go. I'm not very good at saying no. Another excuse we use, we don't have time for God because we have so little concept of God. I really believe this is true. Figured him out a long time ago. Been through lessons on the attributes of God. We know about his love, his mercy, his holiness, his wrath. We know God. Don't need to spend time with God. And you know, combine that with the fact that God is not in your face. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes God will be in your face. You just won't recognize it. He'll bring things into your life that it's him talking to you as plainly as if he were speaking out loud and you'll just pass it off as another coincidence. But he's not really in your face. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. God wants to know who really wants him. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, he says, 
you will find him if you seek after him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's a lot. He doesn't just come because we get a be in our bonnet one day. I think I'll spend a little time with the Lord. He comes to those who want him. Just in case we didn't get he repeats that in Jeremiah 29, 13 and other places in the Bible, you have to want this beloved. God doesn't force himself on anybody. Listen to this poem Spurgeon wrote once. He said, what the hand is to the lute, what the breath is to the flute, what is fragrance to the smell, what the spring is to the well, what the flower is to the bee, that is Jesus Christ to me. What's the mother to the child? What the guide in pathless wild? What is oil to troubled wave? What is ransom to the slave? What is water to the sea? That is Jesus Christ to me. Is that what Jesus Christ is to you? It will tell by whether you are spending time with him or not. You see, I, I try, but the Bible is boring. Then read Samuel. Bible isn't boring, beloved, but we don't try very hard. The Lord wants us to work at it. Get a commentary. Read the Bible and read something that will help you understand what you're reading. Get into a Bible study that you're preparing for on a daily basis. Don't give up. You have to want them. Another reason we don't as seek God is because we feel unworthy. We feel unworthy. So, because we feel unworthy, we set ourselves to make amends so then we can be acceptable to God. And then we'll spend time with him once we get our life kind of squared away, right? That's the way we think. And yet, if you are in Christ this morning, if you're a true believer, really committed your life to Christ, here's what the Bible teaches. Ephesians 1 says that you have already been accepted in the Beloved. Who is the beloved? It's Jesus Christ. So what that means is that when you come before God in Jesus Christ, he's seeing Jesus. You're as accepted as Jesus is. That's pretty accepted. When you think you can't get any more accepted than that. That's your position in Christ. In Christ, you can't get any more accepted Accepted, you can't get any more loved, you can't get any more worthy, you can't get any more forgiven. Just come. Sometimes we don't come because we fear intimacy with God. You know why we fear intimacy with God? Because we know what's deep down inside of us. We know our heart. We know that, yeah, there's some good in there. There's some good intentions. There's some things I'd like to do. There's some ways that I'm good, but we also know the bitterness, the lasciviousness, the hypocrisy. We know all those other things that are hidden down in there, right? We know them, if we're honest. And we don't want to come to God because then he'd see all that stuff. Well, you see the fallacy right away, right? God already knows. He already knows. It's not like he's going to see something when you spend time with him that he didn't already know. God knows you better than you know you. God knows me better than I know me. God knows all of those things about us. And guess what? He loves us anyway. He wants to spend time. Listen, think about it this way. The God of the Trinity, who has absolutely perfect love between the persons of the Trinity, doesn't need anything. That God, who experiences that all the time, that God wants to spend time with you. He wants to. That God loves you even though he knows every imperfection and every rebellion and every secret of your treacherous heart. He wants to spend time with you. So why would we not come? 30 years after he first began to serve the Lord, after he first came to know the Lord, after he had written one third of the New Testament. Here's what Paul said drove him. 
Philippians 3.10, he said that I might know him. That I might know him? Paul? After all you've been through, after everything that has happened to you, you don't think you know him? Yes, I know him, but I want to know more. Paul, after, after, after everything you've written, there's more, infinitely more. But Paul, there's people that you need to go out and evangelize. I mean, think of how the Lord could use you. You know what, I'll, I'll do that as the Lord gives me opportunity, but you know what's first on my list? I want to know him. I want to know him. What will keep us from living frazzled, fragmented, fractured lives? Is it education? Is it raising a great family? Giving to the poor? None of those things, is it? It's to know him. And you can only know him by spending time with him. What is it that will turn our frustration into joy and peace and all the fruit of the Spirit to know him, to be with him? That's first base. That's where you have to start. You can't score. You don't go to first base. I saw an article a few years ago called Singing in Chains, Christianity Today. A man named Mark Buchanan wrote this. He said, Arthur Burns, the Jewish economist of great influence in Washington during the tenure of several presidents, was once asked to pray at a gathering of evangelical politicians. Stunning his hosts, he prayed this way, Lord, I pray that the Jews would come to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that Buddhists would come to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that Muslims would come to know Jesus Christ. And then most stunning of all, he prayed, and Lord, I pray that Christians would come to know Jesus Christ. That's what I pray. That's first base. You skip that, beloved, and all the good things in your life will kill you. But you go there, and you can suddenly get your priorities straightened out and figure out where you need to say yes and where you need to say no and how you need to do it. Don't be fractured by service. Be with him. It's the one thing that's necessary. Great way to start the new year, don't you think? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenge. We acknowledge um, that while we sometimes talk a good talk, Lord, our actions betray a great apathy toward you. It's, it's in many ways, it's, it's, a, it's a product of our affluence. If we knew that our life was on the line, if we knew that persecution was headed our way tomorrow, if we knew that we were going to have to make a life-changing decision, do I claim Christ as many in our world are going to have to do tomorrow? Am I going to claim Christ or am I going to whip out, keep my house, keep my freedom, stay out of jail, maybe in some cases even keep my life, I have a feeling we'd very quickly find out whether we really want you or whether we're just saying that. So Lord, my, my prayer is, I know you love us. I love these people. These people have expressed great love toward my wife and I. Thankful to be co-laborers together, Father, with all the good things going on, with all the wonderful things that you're doing. I'm just praying, would you please send revival into our hearts? As much as we may see and as good as it may be, we acknowledge it's not even close to what it could be. And so our prayer is, turn our hearts toward you. Lord, help us to want you above all things. Help us to be 
on a daily basis doing the one thing that's necessary. I pray that from the bottom of my heart as we close our service, make that our determination, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.